It says, he, the physical embodiment of post-war America, vibrant and youthful and much too cocksure. She, pure carnality softened by kittenish innocence, a symbol of the culture tiptoeing its way toward the sexual revolution. Welcome back, you guys. We are reading Maureen Callahan's Ask Not. This is a book about the Kennedy stories, but focused on the women who were changed, impacted, and had their lives upturned by Kennedy men. First, I need to do a little housekeeping. I have now gotten feedback from you guys about the first episode and I hear you guys say that there is too much background noise from the boys. So I'm going to try to film at times when they are either asleep or less active or not home. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Uh, hopefully today's episode will be an easier listen for those of you who are bothered by that. Um, I will say I have a lot of sons and so our home is a very rambunctious one. So occasionally there are going to be bumps and we live in an old home that was built in 1900. So when the front door shuts, it, it bangs. And when people go up the stairs, we hear it. So I'll do my best, but also life is life. And there's only rarely going to be a time when I can film with absolutely zero background noise. So that said, I will do my best <laughs> because I, I do really want this to be a collaborative, enjoyable experience where I get to process through the things that I am reading in this wonderful book interesting, fascinating book, but also that you get to have a valuable and enjoyable listen while you do whatever you're doing. I know when I listen to channels like this, I like to clean, I like to get things knocked out or when I'm driving. So I hope that if you are doing other things, that this is still an enjoyable listening experience that proves valuable to you, uh, not just informative, but also enjoyable. So with that said, let's jump into part three, which is our chapter four. I'm going more in chapters that are broken up by the actual woman. She has it broken up into parts. And so this is part three, but our chapter four. Okay. The bombshell, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn was the world's biggest sex goddess when she met Jack Kennedy, the rising star of the United States Senate. Now, interestingly, this is summer 1954. He has married Jackie just nine months prior to this. And so in the fall, September 53, he marries Jackie. We are now to summer 54. And Jack is on one of his hunting expeditions, by which he means going to LA to find new women. So nine months into his marriage, he's hunting. And he has been angling particularly to meet Marilyn Monroe. He finally gets his chance at a Hollywood party with Jackie on his arm. Picture this, it is pre-kids. They are still in their first honeymoon year. She's on his arm. I, I'm not cut out for this life, <laughs> but this is what Jackie, signed up for in some regard. So Marilyn is with Joe DiMaggio, her husband of six months, who also happened to be one of America's greatest ball players. And at this point, he is more famous than Jack Kennedy. So Joe DiMaggio, American ball player, beloved, talented, celebrated. And this new Senator, he's only been a Senator, um, He's a rising star in the U.S. Senate, and he is still six years from the presidency. So if you think about, could you name how many senators? There's a hundred U.S. senators, but how many can you actually name? Even if there's a rising star, and even in this constant social media era, we still can't name a huge amount of them. And this was 1954. So he's a rising star, but her husband is an even bigger star. He comes out with, I think I've met you someplace before. And she plays along. They have friends in common. 
And so very quickly, Marilyn slips Jack her number. And a few months later is when Jack is in bed, like we covered two chapters ago, in the hospital, recovering from back surgery that could have killed him. Uh, if he hadn't have gotten this surgery, he probably would have been crippled for life in a wheelchair. So he got this surgery knowing, I want to be president. I don't want to be a cripple. Remember, he's laying in bed and right up above his hospital bed is Marilyn Monroe, except reversed. Her crotch is right above his face. So just a few months after this first meeting, that's when that poster incident happened. Jack had always felt rejected by his mother. She did not give him physical affection. His um, sicknesses and tears meant that she, she was repelled by him and he did not receive much affection. Both Marilyn and Jack had these deeply uh, traumatic childhoods that um, damaged them and made them uh, learn to be people magnet. And it says they had willed themselves into superhuman stratospheres. These descriptions really struck me as apt. It says he, the physical embodiment of post-war America, vibrant and youthful and much too cocksure. She, pure carnality softened by kittenish innocence, a symbol of the culture tiptoeing its way toward the sexual revolution. So you have these two characters. One thing I really appreciate about this book, she zeroes in woman by woman. So she is not trying to do the interplay of exactly which events happened in which order and whether Jack was with Jackie or Marilyn or the interns. She's zeroing in on Marilyn. She's telling us about Marilyn. And these are, these are Marilyn's eyes here at the top. She had a neediness that Jack did not. She wanted two things. She wanted to be loved and she wanted to be smart. She felt that she would have value if powerful men would see beyond her sex appeal and beauty and exterior and instead notice her substance. So that's what she was striving to earn and achieve is to find worthy men and have them reflect back to her that she was worthy. Well, by spring of 1955, Marilyn thought she was happier than she had been in a long time. Her brief marriage to Joe DiMaggio had ended after just nine months. She says that sometimes he would get into moods where he wouldn't speak to her for 10 days. She was just 29 years old. The testimony that she gave to the judge in their divorce proceedings, she said, I hoped to have out of my marriage love, warmth, affection, and understanding, but the relationship was one of coldness and indifference. I voluntarily offered to give up my work in hopes that it would solve our problems, but it did not change his attitude. So she gives this testimony and the judge immediately grants her the divorce. She didn't actually talk about physical abuse that she had suffered. If you remember that famous Marilyn Monroe photo where she's pushing down on her dress, she's over the New York grate and the dress is blowing up around her. Obviously the centerpiece picture that we all um, have seen of Marilyn Monroe. Well, when she filmed that, Joe DiMaggio, her husband at the time was watching and in a rage, he marches up to her and grabs her and is so furious that her right arm was black and blue afterward from the, the fury that he unleashed on her um, just by way of filming this scene. And whatever you, whatever worldview we come from, if we would say, well, she was a little bit, you know, risque or whatever, um, it was a playful image where she's covering up her private areas. Um, 
and this is who she was. So he didn't marry somebody who was a you know Roman Catholic nun, <laughs> and then she went to this place. He didn't marry a sweet little chaste uh, country girl. He married the sex symbol of the era. So he's furious that she's done this, but this revealed things about him, and the judge, even without hearing this story, says yes divorce him. So she is happy and she feels that she's been set free um, after such a short marriage. Even though people were trashing her reputation, calling her a whore, saying um, they were sending her really creepy, abusive uh, mail. Um, one had human feces in it. She was being trashed in the papers as not worthy of Joe DiMaggio because of course he was still beloved by the American public, but she didn't care. She was just so grateful to get away. And she was particularly thankful that the judge believed her testimony about Joe DiMaggio. So that actually tracks with those earlier desires of just, she just wants worthy men to reflect back value to her. And in this moment, a judge had done that for her. She had not even told the worst stories that she had in her pocket. And yet the judge reflects back to her that you're worthy of more than this. Now, she needed this because it says Marilyn had so much trauma in her past. She had been abandoned her whole life, passed from adult to adult used and abused, sent from foster home to foster home, violated and molested and raped and made to feel worthless. But hadn't she vanquished all of that? She had shed that Norma Jean Baker, little girl, innocent image in favor of this created image of Marilyn Monroe. And so she has this dream and the, the, it's a nightmare that's a recurrent nightmare for her. She has this dream that a surgeon is cutting her open. And as he cuts her open, there is nothing. The only thing that comes out is this fine sawdust. And the sawdust spills all over the floor. And she has this horror of people waking up and being let down by the emptiness inside of her. And so this is her great fear. She goes through it with therapists. Um, it seems to embody what she fears most, that people are gonna cut her open and find that she is vacuous. So she actually forms a relationship with a playwright, Arthur Miller. They had met in a movie set and he had kind of advocated for her um, initially when people were laughing at her and devaluing whether or not she could be a good actress. He speaks up for her and means it when he says she should consider acting on the stage. And so they reconnected right after her divorce was final and very quickly they throw themselves into this relationship and get married. They married on June 29th, 1956. So they get married very quickly. <clears throat> she did not heed the warnings. She felt that um, he had pursued her. He had left his first wife. And by the way, he had been married to this wife for 16 years. Arthur and Mary had been married for 16 years and Mary's humiliation was compounded by the fame, beauty, and sexual vibrancy of her rival. So you can just imagine being a wife to a man, helping build him up in his career, have children with him, you're 16 years in, that's significant length of time, significant length of shared experiences, and very rapidly he drops you like a hot potato and goes for the sexiest woman in the world. So yeah, I'm sure Mary did feel very humiliated by that. So they get married. She wants Arthur to be proud of her. Because Arthur is respectful toward her, she feels that she has freedom, that a studio boss isn't gonna be making decisions for her. She won't have to get plastic surgery or be told that she's this or that, that she has this husband who's really accepting and supportive of her. This is what her hopes are. She, wants to be like that. She wants to be um, not tied to 
only appearance and having powerful men tell you what you have to be. She actually really loves Arthur. She's out of her mind crazy about him, actually. She ignored the cynics, and the cynics thought that he had married down and that she married up. They called them the egghead and the hourglass. But to Marilyn, he really was the sexiest man in the world, and she felt that she could be vulnerable with him. She actually said, I love him. She writes this in her diary. I love him, and he is the only person I have ever known that I could love, not only as a man to whom I'm attracted. She says, he is the only person that I trust as much as myself. So she's totally head over heels and she is very trusting. This is insightful. She's granting trust very quickly. He comes to resent her. In fact, he leaves his uh, notebook where he writes his personal thoughts around their home and she finds this notebook and she realizes it actually says that he had been embarrassed, embarrassed of her. She had only been his wife for two weeks when she found this. So she thinks that she's getting someone who's accepting and supportive and um, really values her and is really going to give her that, um, that appreciation of substance that she desires. And instead what she gets is somebody who is embarrassed of her. Well, Jack Kennedy comes along. She had already slipped him her number back when she was married to Joe DiMaggio. Well, during his 1960 run for president, Jackie is home six months pregnant and Marilyn is seated with Jack Peter, who is Jack's brother-in-law, married to Jack's sister, Patricia, and another man. And Jack begins moving his hand higher than usual, and he is shocked to realize that she is commando. She is not wearing any underwear. And he turns bright red. He actually, she realizes that she can scandalize JFK. She loved it. She found it hilarious. And so this sets up some of how she begins to interact with him, to try to get a rise out of him, to try to give him a thrill and to shock. <clears throat> so she thinks, you know, when he's the leader of the free world, I'll be by his side in some ways. And she starts to think, this is smart. This is a smart man who is giving back to me what I crave. She delighted him, even as her own husband found her tiresome, uninteresting, and intellectually lacking. Her husband doesn't want her. Very quickly, he goes from dropping his wife, leaving his family, embracing this starlet, and now he has dropped her. But Jackie's husband is happy to come in with desire. She is acting on a film around this time with Laurence Olivier. He tells the cast and crew that Marilyn was a trifle, a bauble, a nothing. She wasn't an artist or a real actress. She was just a starlet with a shelf life, out of her league with all these great men. Well, Olivier knew that this was the way to humiliate her. So her husbands have made her feel undesirable, worthless, vacuous. Her dream gives her that deep fear. Her childhood left her traumatized and even her peers in the film industry who, you know, whatever you think about someone like this, she clearly was getting eyes on the screen. And if you're an actor, that's actually what you need is you need people's eyeballs to be interested. And she certainly had that. She had that it factor that draw, drew eyeballs. And so was Olivier saying this out of spite? Was he saying this out of, I, I don't think it's out of integrity. Maybe it's out of self 
um, building himself up <laughs> in comparison. Um, but Marilyn is feeling devalued by everyone. Jack Kennedy had not made her feel this way. Here was a man who was known for surrounding himself by the best and brightest. He loved Hollywood gossip, so she could enter in on that. And he never treated her as if the characteristics that made her the sex symbol necessarily made her dumb. Maureen Callahan leaves us with a final section <clears throat> that is insightful about Marilyn and then we'll move into kind of thinking through these things together. So, only Marilyn's shrinks had any inkling why she spoke that way. Why some women who were abused as children sometimes adopt a child's voice. It was a way of saying, I'm smaller than you. Please don't hurt me. She never thought Jack Kennedy would hurt her. I'll start here. I thought this was really insightful. I've known some people who have affectations of a, a tiny voice, a small voice. Um, one that comes to mind is Michelle Duggar. <clears throat> I have, I'm not at all casting aspersions on her or her childhood, but I know people like that who have taken on the posture of a very small person. And this author is putting forth for us that at least Marilyn's therapists believed that this small voice was her way of making herself small and worthy of protection. And that's insightful. We also get this ominous sentence. I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts about this because at this point in our reading, we have a better picture already. If you came into this book with zero knowledge of JFK's personal sexual behavior, at this point in the book, we've already been exposed to enough that this final sentence is very ominous. She never thought Jack Kennedy would hurt her. So I think we're gonna be set up for a future chapter, which there is a future chapter uh, about her. She gets one more chapter in this book. So we, we will revisit Marilyn Monroe. But we're being set up, obviously, for that payoff. Um, how will Jack hurt her? Because we know, we know that he already has trifled with women all the way through. His wife knew what she was getting into. She was even lied to um, in the kind of contract for their marriage in regard to, she knew he would womanize. She did not know about his medical problems. Um, <clears throat> but then he's got Mimi Beardsley. He's got Diana DeVeg. He's got um, other women that he is toying along and pulling along. And Jackie clearly not his one and only. <clears throat> well, Marilyn won't be his one and only either, is my prediction. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And, and I, um, of course, we know how it all ends, um, but I actually don't know uh, the future of their relationship. I know about the Mr. President section. So I'm looking forward to that chapter. I'm looking forward to learning more about what their relationship looked like as time went along. So she titled this section The Bombshell, and I thought about that, and of course she's a blonde bombshell, she was beautiful, all of that, but also the the imagery of an actual explosion, um, and you can almost feel it, right? Did you? I would love to hear your thoughts about uh, when Jackie is there on his arm meeting the bombshell, and it, it, it would be like a bombshell going off in your heart, I think, as a, as a newlywed, to have this the most beautiful woman in the world, um, meeting your husband and knowing at some point there's slipping of numbers in pockets, there are jokes, there are winks. It just feels sad for Jackie. Um, and then finally, just looking at the Marilyn Monroe, the person, 
I'd love to hear your insights. Perhaps you've read other things or know more about her. So I would be interested to hear that in the comments below of her abuse childhood, the way she had been used and humiliated and treated all through her life. And then um, her marriages, you know, always wanting and not quite getting this um, affirmation that her soul craved of, am I valuable? Does anybody find me smart? Is my dream really true that I'm just an empty, empty thing once you cut me open? So insightful things here. This is going to be a shorter video, but I hope you will like, subscribe, and share these videos. My hope after hearing back from you guys is to do two a week and we'll see if we can get those done. I am about to go on vacation and so I'm trying to get the, the release times for these videos lined up to where two times a week we can have those and then in a few weeks I start teaching again. Um, for now we've talked about Marilyn and the next chapter is Mary Richardson Kennedy. So we're going to get into a new Kennedy woman next. I hope you all have a great day. I'm really grateful for your participation in the comments. That has been really fun. Even the negative feedback about the audio situation. I really appreciate it because I do want to make uh, an end product that I'm proud of, but that is also useful and enjoyable to other people. My goal is not just to get on here and make a video and then it's horrible and it's tough to listen to. I really do want to do a good job. So if you have any more feedback in that vein, I totally welcome it. You don't have to feel bad about saying it. Um, and yeah, I really look forward to reading your comments. Y'all have a great day. Bye.